meet tonight's presenter. Wayne Angst is the retired state librarian and commissioner of the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives. A lifelong lover of books and reading, he took his first job at the age of 16 in the Laurel County Public Library. After obtaining degrees in history and library science from the University of Kentucky, he was a librarian at the Kenton County Public Library for 27 years, serving as director of the library from 1999 to 2006. In 2006, he was appointed state librarian and commissioner and served until 2015. He has authored two books, Buffalo Trails to the 21st Century, A History of Erlanger, Kentucky, and Presidential Visits to Kentucky, 1819 and 2017. Wayne and his wife, Debbie, are residents of Erlanger, Kentucky. They have two sons and three granddaughters. So thank you so much, Wayne, for joining us. Several years ago, uh, the president came to Kentucky. I, I was reading articles about it in the newspaper and I wondered how often this had happened. Um, seemed like it was something that I hadn't heard of in a few years. So I started looking in, into it and doing some research and I was surprised to find that very little research had been done. In fact, there was no list of the presidential visits, um, not very much information at all. Uh, so I began to do some research, uh, began to go back through newspaper files, contacted the, the uh, presidential libraries, I read some presidential biographies, looked at histories of the administrations and began piecing it together. I found out um, there's a lot of history related to presidential visits. I learned a lot about Kentucky history while I was doing it. And I found that there's usually some kind of interesting story, either why the visit came about or things that happened during the visit or who the president met. So um, I thought I'd put together some research. So what I found was that presidents have visited Kentucky about 130 times in, in our history. 27 different presidents have visited Kentucky while they were serving as president. 18 of those presidents have visited Northern Kentucky. James Monroe was the first one. Uh, Monroe and Andrew Jackson were the only presidents prior to the Civil War to visit Kentucky. But since the Civil War, only three presidents have not visited. Uh, only James A. Garfield, who of course served a very brief term. Uh, Grover Cleveland, who didn't travel very much during his two terms. And Calvin Coolidge uh, didn't visit. Calvin Coolidge um, visited uh, when he was running uh, when he was running for vice president, uh, and he visited Kentucky afterwards. But uh, every other president has visited uh, the state at some point. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just realized that I forgot to say the trivia question. Okay. So every time, if you've watched the program, we always have a trivia question, and the, the first. Um, correct respondent on Zoom or on Facebook Live can win a really cool prize. So tonight's question is, there is one spot in Kentucky that has been visited more often by presidents than any other. Where is it? So go ahead and get those um, guesses in on the chat or on Facebook Live. Go ahead and leave those in the comments and we'll get to that at the end. Once again, sorry to interrupt. It's okay. I, we're not gonna talk about all 130 presidential visits now. We don't have that much time. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about the very first visit, which was so very different than the visits that we, um, that we see today. We're gonna to talk about the uh, times when the president's come to Northern Kentucky and made public appearances. And we'll talk about uh, maybe a few other interesting stories that have happened through the years when the president's visited the state. Uh, we see the president on TV basically every night. Everything the president does is documented uh, he makes headlines on a daily basis. Uh, so we, we see him all the time. But that certainly was not the case in uh, 1819 when uh, James Monroe visited Kentucky for the very first time. He became the first president. Uh, a trip from uh, Washington, D.C. to Kentucky uh, at that point uh, was long, arduous, and, and quite dangerous. So the first four presidents were not able, able to visit. But imagine a time when the president left Washington for four months, um, basically dropped out of sight. The only uh, way to contact him was on a horse, uh, with, with, on a fast horse with a, with a rider. Uh, otherwise, he was, he was uh, virtually absent from the government. And that was precisely the case 
when James Monroe made his first visit. Uh, he left uh, Washington by steamboat on March the 30th. Uh, there was no advance team. There was no press traveling with him, uh, no security. He was accompanied by his uh, nephew and, and his private secretary, who, who soon thereafter became his uh, son-in-law. An interesting uh, aspect of this trip also was that Monroe paid his, all of his own expenses as the government didn't provide any money for presidential travel at that time. Uh, it was not seen as a uh, duty that was, uh, was established by the Constitution. So if the president traveled, he used his own money. Monroe was one of those Virginia uh, planners who was land rich but cash poor. He always um, behind on his debts, always trying to cover his expenses. Um, of course, slavery was very it was a very expensive uh, operation, so uh, he he was he really didn't have a lot of money to travel on. In fact, in his very first trip that he made as president uh, up the East Coast, he sold his personal furniture to the government to replace the furniture that had been lost uh, when the British burned the White House in the War of 1812. But um, so as he traveled on this trip, he paid his own expenses, stopped wherever he could. Uh, he actually went down the coast to Charleston and Savannah, then traveled across country to uh, the wilderness of, of Alabama and virtually disappeared. Um, no one in Washington knew exactly where he was. And in fact, some of the newspapers in Washington uh, reported that he had died on the trip. But he eventually showed up in uh, Nashville at the home of Andrew Jackson. Now he had intended all along to come to Kentucky because he told the his uh, administrators in Washington when, uh, when he left, if there were any important papers to send those to Lexington, Kentucky, where he would, uh, where he would see them. So he, uh, he left, he left the Hermitage with Andrew Jackson uh, on June the, uh, June the 24th uh, and, and came into Kentucky. It took him a few days, of course, from Nashville to get to Kentucky. Uh, it was quite a long journey from Nashville to, uh, to Louisville. So um, along the way, they stopped at homes. They stopped at inns, wherever they could stop for the night. And it must have been pretty interesting when uh, the President of the United States and Andrew Jackson, the hero of New Orleans, stopped at someone's home and asked to spend the night. But that's exactly what happened. Uh, Monroe was uh, very popular in Kentucky. Uh, he's considered somewhat of a favorite son because uh, before Kentucky was a state, he had represented uh, Virginia in the uh, uh, Continental Congress, and he had always supported uh, the Kentucky's right to use freely use the Mississippi River transport goods. And that was the only way farmers had to get their pro products to New Orleans and to sell them. Uh, he'd also been an advocate of Kentucky's statehood all along. Uh, uh, he was a um, follower of Jefferson, which, who of course was very popular in Kentucky. So Kentuckians loved him. Wherever he went, they flocked to see him. Um, new, local newspapers would uh, announce that he was coming, uh, but they didn't know exactly when. He didn't have a real, a real firm schedule. So uh, lookouts would, uh, would wait outside of town. Uh, when, as President Monroe uh, got near, uh, folks would rush out to meet him. They would have a welcoming committee. They would invite him into town where he would make speeches and, uh, and uh, visit with, with, his, uh, with the residents there. Uh, the, um, the trip had some political implications. Monroe was getting ready to run for reelection um, and um, he wanted to mend some fences. Henry Clay was a possible opponent. So uh, Monroe wanted to make sure that Clay knew how popular uh, he was and that he was ready to take him on. Uh, Clay was not in the state at that time, but he later did meet with, with Monroe at the very end of his visit. But um, the, some of the newspapers uh, in Kentucky, interestingly enough, um, asked the folks not to, to uh, receive the president as a god, as they, as they called him. Um, the Republic was new, um, and there were some concerns about um, treating the president like the king 
had been treated in Great Britain. Of course, the Revolutionary War, part of the objective of that was to get to, uh, get rid of the king and, and the royal government. So there was still, even, even at this point, there was concern that the president should not be treated like a king. And there was a note in one of the newspapers as, as the president left after a month that, that read, we've been led to hope that he would be treated on his passage through the state as a man and not as a god. But in this, we have been disappointed. So, so the folks really did appreciate his visit. They came out to show him, to celebrate him. Uh, President Monroe came to Kentucky, as I mentioned, for political reasons, but also he came for some personal reasons. He owned thousands and thousands of acres of land in Kentucky. In fact, when he was in Lexington during this trip, he sold uh, land that he had owned in Campbell and Pendleton counties. Uh, he had planned to come north to Cincinnati and then go down the, the uh, Ohio River um, to St. Louis. But when he got to Lexington, he had been gone from Washington, as, as I mentioned, for more than three months. He was tired, he was sick. So instead of going north and west, uh, he stopped at Harrodsburg. And you may know that at that time in the mid, mid 1800s, uh, Harrodsburg had a lot of mineral springs famous for health that people went to for health reasons. So the president went to Harrodsburg. He asked for no public visitors uh, and he rested and used the mineral springs to recover his health. And then he returned to DC uh, on the old wilderness road down through the wilderness. So he's gone from, for more than four months at that time. Uh, you can see his, his visit here. Um, he covered really a, a, large, a large part of the state uh, all on horseback. And it was the longest, obviously the longest presidential visit to Kentucky. Uh, he was here more than a month and uh, covered a lot of territory. And saw a lot of people, and for many people, it was the very first connection they had with the with the new federal government. And the trip certainly was considered successful. Monroe ran for re-election. Of course, that was he was re-elected unanimously. The only time that the president has, has ever done that. Uh, Andrew Jackson was the only other president before the Civil War to visit Kentucky. Uh, of course, his home was in Nashville, as we mentioned. And he came back to Tennessee from, from Washington four times during his eight year term. Um, he came close to Northern Kentucky in 1830, he came down the Ohio River, but uh, he, uh, he didn't stop in Northern Kentucky, but he, he did stop in Cincinnati. But he, um, as you, uh, of course that was before the locks and dams were, were on the Ohio. And during the summer, it was the real problem on the Ohio River, the water level would get so low that uh, boats, uh, boats didn't have enough water to float. Uh, but he didn't make it in, a, in 1830. However, between Maysville and Cincinnati, the shaft on his uh, boat broke and he was, his boat was set adrift. He was rescued by a party from Cincinnati that was coming to, to meet him. And they uh, hauled him and his boat back, in, back into Cincinnati. But and it's interesting that the president could be uh, left adrift in the middle of the Ohio River, but that was certainly the case. Um, Andrew John after the Civil War, Andrew Johnson also came up to, uh, came up the Ohio, but he he, he didn't come to to uh, Northern Kentucky. And of course, during and after the Civil War, transportation became much easier as railroads were built, so the president could travel uh, much much easier, and presidents did take advantage of of railroads. And, uh, and visited much more of the country. So the first president to visit Northern Kentucky was uh, President Ulysses S. Grant. Um, many people in Northern Kentucky are familiar with the Grant story. Uh, of course, presidents came to, the, to Kentucky for many reasons, but I believe Grant was the only president to come to visit family. Came three times to Kentucky, all to Covington to visit his family. His father was Jesse Root Grant, this picture you see there. Um, he had moved to, Jesse Root Grant had moved to Covington in the mid 1850s um, and uh, bought the house at, that you see on the right on Greenup Street that's still, still there. Um, look, it looks very much the same in some ways, but uh, 
Jesse Ward Grant was a very unique individual, uh, very unusual, eccentric in some ways. And he was uh, quite a man around town. President Johnson appointed him Covington Postmaster in order to, to uh, gain favor with, with uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And um, Jesse Ward Grant was often a, um, a problem for his son because he, he tried to get involved in his son's affairs as his son became more and more famous. Well, after, uh, pre after Ulysses S. Grant became president, he visited with his family uh, first in September of 1871. Of course, that was the first time the president had been to this area. So uh, the city wanted to welcome him in a big way and celebrate him. Um, he, uh, the afternoon that he arrived, he went to the home of Amos Schenkel, uh, which is uh, Mr. Schenkel's picture on the left there, um, also a famous name, and he financed the, of course, the Roebling Suspension Bridge. He was very wealthy, one of the, probably one of the most wealthy folks um, in the area, philanthropist. He built the mansion that you see on the right there on 2nd Street, and which uh, later became the uh, first Salvation Army General Hospital in the United States. And of course, uh, later it was torn down and Booth Hospital was built on the site. So uh, many of you are probably familiar with, with where that is located. So it's quite near his parents' home. So when the president arrived in town, he went to the mansion and had tea with, uh, with the Schenkels. That evening, the city uh, had a parade for the president from, uh, came down, uh, uh, from fifth, came down uh, Fifth Street and fifth, from Fifth and Scott to the mansion where they, where President Grant came out on the, on the porch there and uh, the city welcomed him, they made speeches. Grant was, didn't like, to, at that point in his uh, career, didn't like to speak very much. So he said a few words, thanking the crowd because it was so many Republicans and Democrats together. Uh, Grant was a popular general in the area, but he was not a popular politician and in fact, even though his family lived here, uh, he, he uh, lost the elections for president here in both 1868 and 1872. But um, anyway, he, he got a really warm reception and um, spoke briefly, then they all went back, in, back inside for a reception. Um, he came again in the next year, 1872, for the final time he visited with his father. Father was ill, his father wrote him a letter and told him, and asked him to come and visit him one more time because he felt like he was not going to make it through the winter. Um, he had had a stroke, uh, uh, was not doing well. However, there was some controversy because he refused to resign as postmaster, even though he could no longer do the job. Uh, President Grant got a lot of criticism uh, because he wouldn't resign. And uh, he came to try to convince his father to do so, but, but uh, Jesse Rue Grant was stubborn and he never resigned, and um, he died the next year. In June of 1873, uh, President Grant came back for his funeral. Uh, he was not here when he died, but uh, he, he arrived just a few hours after that. Uh, the funeral was, um, uh, the body was carried from the home on Fifth Street across, uh, or across, um, across Greenup Street to the church there on the corner. Uh, and the funeral was still from the church. Jesse Rue Grant holds the distinction of there's only two men in, in the American history who have watched their sons be inaugurated as president twice. And Jesse Rue Grant was one of those. Of course, the other one was um, George Bush. But uh, funeral was quite, uh, was quite large. Um, Jesse Rue Grant was a, was a rather famous figure locally. Plus, the president was there. So thousands of people came uh, to the funeral and uh, the burial was in Spring Grove Cemetery. The president left right after that, right after the service and he never came back to Kentucky while he was president. He did visit, visit later. Um, following Grant, uh, President Hayes and President Harrison both came through Northern Kentucky, but they didn't visit. 
But the next pre the next president to visit was Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt loved to travel, uh, travel more by far more than any other president up to that time. And uh, he visited Kentucky five times. He had campaigned in Covington in 1900 when he was running for vice president. A uh, large crowd, I think it was uh, the newspaper report said 5,000 folks uh, around the courthouse in Covington. Uh, but this, the story was that he, uh, he there were some hecklers there and he spent most of his time uh, arguing with the hecklers rather than speaking. But he, uh, he did come back in 1902 for his first visit uh, on the train, came through Ludlow on Southern Railroad, spoke a few words to the assembled crowd and left. There's, uh, the local newspapers didn't cover it for, for some reason, maybe for political reasons, I don't know. But the New York Times did mention it and that's how we know about it. He also came in 1903 uh, to this area by rail. He stopped and spoke uh, in Walton for a, for a crowd. Now this trip is significant because when he left Walton, he went, went through Louisville and on, on out west. Um, the purpose of his trip was to get some relaxation and to hunt bears. Um, ended up in, in Mississippi, which is uh, wilderness at the time, pretty wild. And, um, and hunted for bears. He had a press contingent with him. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't find the bear. And for Roosevelt, who uh, he really uh, was concerned about his image, uh, he didn't like the fact that the newspaper reporters across the country were reporting he couldn't couldn't catch the bear. Well, he finally finally did he finally did run across a small bear. Unfortunately, that was it which he, did, he didn't shoot the small bear, he turned it loose, and, but the newspapers reported it. So he's very upset about that. Um, and one of the uh, New York Times re um, reporters made, made a joke out of it in a, in a cartoon, rather famous cartoon now. And small bears started showing up, small stuffed bears started showing up in New York toy stores and they begin to call them teddy bears. So that was how uh, we, got, uh, we got the teddy bear, which of course is um, probably one of the lasting significant things of the Roosevelt administration. Um, he came back in 1905, uh, again by train. Um, and at, at that point, um, of course, the president almost always traveled by train. And the, the government continued to refuse to pay for, his ex, for the expenses. So the uh, train companies would offer the president when he wanted to travel their most luxurious accommodations. So uh, the, the president of the railroad companies would give them their personal car to travel. But in 1906, uh, Congress finally began to regulate the railroads. And so providing the president uh, with a with a uh, with a free car, when at the same time he was responsible for regulating the railroads, seemed was became a conflict of interest. And Congress debated whether or not to pay for the president's travel. Uh, a uh, the leader, the leading person who uh, opposed this was a Kentucky congressman, who said that the president had no business being outside of Washington. Uh, all they did was, was uh, do political stuff and the taxpayer shouldn't be paying for it. But they finally did agree to, to offer $25,000 a year for presidential travel. And Roosevelt quickly went through that money and had to ask for more. But uh, his most famous and, and significant trip to Kentucky was in uh, 1909. It was his very last major trip as president. And it was to the uh, Lincoln birthplace. This was the centennial of the birth of Abraham Lincoln, 1909. The farm where Lincoln was, uh, was born, and maybe many of you have been there. It's a, it's a beautiful, wonderful place. Uh, the farm where he was born, had, uh, after the Lincoln family left, uh, of course, there was a, a land dispute. and They couldn't hold on to the property. It fell into bankruptcy, uh, to uh, foreclosure. 
and it was to be sold at the courthouse door. Well, a, a whiskey company uh, was uh, offering to buy the property and they would use the spring that the Lincoln family had used um, for the water to make whiskey. A lot of people objected to that. I didn't think that was an appropriate use of that, of that Lincoln birthplace, which um, really was, uh, many people considered a cradle of democracy, one of those very special places in the country. So a group of, in New York, uh, group of, of bankers and lawyers started to collect money from across the country to buy the farm. And they were, they were, very, they were very successful, got quite a bit of money, um, Many of, uh, many of you have seen the, the cabin that's located there, the Abraham Lincoln birthplace cabin. It had been on tour around the country. So, uh, so they raised enough money to bring the cabin back also. And uh, there was no Lincoln Memorial at that time. So a lot of people hoped that this would eventually become the one place in the country where people would come to uh, remember Lincoln and to celebrate uh, his, his life. So they invited President Roosevelt to come in 199 and uh, break ground, uh, lay the cornerstone for the memorial building that was to be built there. It was his very, as I mentioned, his very last trip to the state, uh, uh, very last trip as president. He was somewhat concerned because uh, President Taft was getting ready to be inaugurated and Roosevelt feared that uh, people would consider him um, as the uh, former president, person going out of office, nobody would care about him and nobody would show up. So he was very surprised when um, on the train, he, he crossed, on the, crossed into Newport and from, New, went from Newport to Louisville and then down to uh, Podgenville. All along the way, people were out uh, to see the train, to wave flags, to wave at him. Uh, and uh, the press report said that he, he ran from side to side uh, to see the folks, he was so excited and, and so pleased with his reception. And you can see when he was, as he was finished, uh, this is a, a postcard that shows that his family was with him. You can see uh, President Roosevelt uh, on the left side, uh, walking down the hill and the cabin is up on the back behind in the back. Uh, for those of you that have been there, you know the, where the memorial building is, the memorial building set there on the spot where the cabin is. And uh, it's what we see today. His wife and his daughter were with him, and uh, he later said that that was one of the one of the uh, best trips he took as president. Um, of course, President Taft was his successor. President Taft lived uh, was from Cincinnati, lived just across the river, but and he did pass through Northern Kentucky a couple of times, but he but he never stopped here. His uh, first trip was a little, little interesting, one to Northern Kentucky, but I'm gonna talk just a little bit about it. It came down the Mississippi River. The, the uh, Panama Canal had just been opened. And unfortunately, the Mississippi was not a very navigable river at that time. The big boats coming through the Panama Canal could not navigate the Mississippi River. So President Taft uh, was trying to, encourage Congress to spend the money to deepen the, the channel of the Mississippi and widen it so those big boats could come through. So he made a, made a trip down the Mississippi to uh, campaign for that. He uh, stopped first at um, Cairo, Illinois, uh, made a speech there uh, to, to quite, quite a large crowd. When he left, uh, the group wanted to provide his lunch. Uh, it was early in the morning, so they, they brought his lunch to him. Of course, President Taft was a very refined gentleman, uh, his family very wealthy. Uh, he'd been uh, was a, a Yale graduate, uh, spent a lot of time up east, very refined taste. For his lunch, folks in Cairo provided him with a big, fat, baked possum. Well, you know, I, I can only imagine what President Taft felt about that, but he, he graciously thanked him and took the possum on the boat with him. His next stop was just a few miles down the river in Hickman, Kentucky. This is the farthest point west in Kentucky, uh, 
and you, but you can see a, a very heavily Democratic area at that time. Um, of course, half of it was Republican, but you can see the reception. It's a huge reception. And uh, so his, his boat comes into Hickman and he made a speech there, which was received quite warmly. When he, when he stepped off the boat to make his speech, uh, he was, uh, press asked him, Mr. President, how did you like your possum, your lunch? And he told him, well, he said, I, I couldn't believe it, but somebody got to that possum before I did. I didn't get a bite of it. It's, some of these people got it and, you know, it's just terrible, but I'm sure it was good and they enjoyed it. So he made a speech. Well, when he, when he got, when he finished his speech, he um, thanked the crowd, walked back to his boat, got ready to get on. And they rushed up to him in, with, with another gift. And it was, Mr. President, we're so sorry you didn't get any of that possum. We've brought you another one. So they gave him another possum to take with him down the river. So I don't know if, I don't know what happened to that one, but I, I did, couldn't find uh, any press about what, what the result of that possum was. Um, a more uh, another trip that the president Taft took that I thought you might be interested in uh, was um, a couple years later in 1911. He came to the Lincoln birthplace. Uh, it had been finished, and he wanted to dedicate it. Uh, but he made one stop prior to that in Frankfurt in the state capitol. This is the state capitol, new state capitol had had been recently opened. He came to dedicate the Lincoln statue that was in the Capitol. For those of you that have been to the Kentucky State Capitol in the rotunda, the very middle of the rotunda, there's a statue of Abraham Lincoln. And it's boots very shiny where people have, have rubbed it for so long. Been there for over 110 years. Well, President Taft dedicated that statue in 1911. And this is a photograph of, of that. Um, The uh, next president to come to the area was uh, Warren G. Harding. Uh, Warren G. Harding never stepped, actually stepped foot on Kentucky soil, but he did float on Kentucky water. And uh, there's an interesting story uh, about his visit in 1922. He came to Kentucky for the centennial of the birth of Ulysses S. Grant. You may remember last year, the bicentennial was celebrated, um, but um, President Grant was born in Point Pleasant, Ohio, just up the river from, from, from here. Warren G. Harding agreed to come and speak at the, uh, at the centennial. He planned to go on the Island Queen. There the, um, a flotilla was planned for the, for the visit that day, much like uh, the tall stacks that we've that we've all experienced. Well, um, the Island Queen was one of the was one of the boats, and uh, the president was uh, expected to travel on the Island Queen, and he's going to come back on the Morning Star. And tickets were sold for those vessels, with the understanding the president was going to be on them. However, when the um, Secret Service learned of this, they weren't too happy with the idea of the president traveling on the Island Queen, knowing that, uh, you know, uh, there's some, uh, probably some folks who had partied a long time that would be on that boat. They were celebrating and people were packed, were gonna be packed on the boat and they thought it wasn't such a hot idea. So the night before, they decided that the president should go on the Cayuga. And so that morning, the morning of the, of the speech, he got on the Cayuga and went up river. And it was quite a fortuitous decision because um, as the boats went up the river, the Ohio River, folks lined both sides of the river, the Kentucky side and the Ohio side. And in fact, schools had been called off that day. Businesses were closed to celebrate the president. Uh, there were parties on both sides. And as the boat neared um, Point Pleasant, fireworks fireworks were, uh, were shot from, from uh, the Ohio side. So when that happened uh, on the Island Queen, uh, the passengers on the Island Queen rushed to one side of the boat. 
the deck collapsed and there were a number of serious injuries. So fortunately, the president was not on, on that boat at all. Um, it was, um, I guess, an omen because uh, later that year, uh, the Island Queen burned in dry dock. And of course, uh, the next year, uh, President Harding died on a, on a trip to the West. So it was um, an ill-fated, kind of an ill-fated trip. Um, President uh, Coolidge, as I mentioned, did not come to Kentucky and uh, President Hoover came several times, but he never made a public appearance uh, in Northern Kentucky. But the next president who did was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, again, like President Theodore Roosevelt, he loved to travel. Um, he traveled uh, five times to Kentucky, he matched, matched Theodore Roosevelt's visits. His first visit in 1934 was uh, to Harrodsburg. Uh, to Fort, he was uh, dedicating a monument at Fort Harrod uh, State Park. It was one of his first um, major visits especially to uh, celebrate uh, a monument that had been built during uh, with uh, WPA money. So he came to Harrodsburg. It was quite a crowd. You know, people didn't get to see the president very often. And this is the kind of crowds the president would draw. Uh, this is in Harrodsburg, uh, thousands and thousands of folks um, just, just to see the president. Um, his most famous Kentucky visit, however, was in 1938, and it was to Latonia Racetrack. Uh, the reason that this uh, visit was, was so significant, uh, by 1938, uh, many of the New Deal uh, initiatives were running into opposition. Uh, the Supreme Court was conservative, Congress was becoming more conservative and Roosevelt was having a lot of trouble getting his policies, uh, even through Congress. The man that he depended on more than any other to get his legislation through uh, was Senator Alvin Barkley, who you see on the right. Uh, he was the majority leader. Of course, he was a Kentuckian, the majority leader of the Senate. He was up for re-election in 1938 and Roosevelt absolutely had to have him re-elected. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the young, uh, popular, young, charismatic, ambitious governor of Kentucky, Albert Benjamin Chandler, who is seated in the middle, uh, decided that he uh, wanted to run for the Senate. His term was up the next year. At that time, Kentucky governors could only serve one term. He was looking for his next office, and he decided that the Senate was the place where he wanted to be, so he's going to challenge Barkley in the Democratic primary. Uh, President Roosevelt called him into the Oval Office and asked him personally not to run, uh, but uh, Chandler did it anyway. So uh, President Roosevelt decided he was going to make a trip to Kentucky to campaign for Barkley. This was unprecedented. Uh, certainly a president didn't get involved in uh, party primary politics, but Roosevelt felt like it was imperative that he do it. So his first stop that day was at Latonia Racetrack. Um, and when he, um, he, he uh, came to the uh, Union Terminal and when he arrived, stepped, and he was, when he was uh, taken off the train in the terminal, who was there but Governor Chandler waiting for him. Uh, of course, Governor Chandler knew that Roosevelt was coming to speak in behalf of his opponent, but he showed up anyway, and that was just the kind of guy he was. Um, there was there was a huge, huge crowd. Uh, all the businesses closed that day. Uh, people were given holiday days off. Uh, racetrack was packed. Uh, there were uh, tens tens of thousands of folks there to hear President Roosevelt, who was immensely popular in this area and in all of Kentucky. And uh, Roosevelt made his speech on behalf of Barkley with Chandler sitting right on the speaker stand with him, by the middle of him. But uh, 
he uh, he completed his speech. Uh, the photograph that you see here, uh, there was a lot of controversy because uh, Barkley, of course, criticized Chandler. He claimed that that uh, Chandler jumped in the car and climbed between the two men, uh, so he'd be in the middle. Chandler, on the other hand, argued that he had been invited to sit there, which uh, was likely not true. But Roosevelt uh, later told folks that Chandler had more gall than any politician he ever met. Um, the election, uh, uh, Roosevelt finished his tour the election was extremely dirty. Probably, uh, we, th we think we have dirty campaigns today, but that one was probably the worst ever. And in fact, uh, as a result, there were congressional hearings as a result of this campaign and the Hatch Act was passed to try to prevent candidates from using uh, government resources for political purposes. Chandler claimed that Alvin Barkley used federal money uh, for his, in his campaign and Barkley claimed that Chandler to use state money in his campaign, and both of them were probably true. But uh, Barkley uh, defeated him rather easily and went on to uh, uh, serve as majority leader for another term. Ironically, the other senator from Kentucky died the following year, and Chandler uh, resigned as governor and was appointed to that Senate seat, so he got to the Senate anyway. Uh, Roosevelt made a couple of other trips to Kentucky after, following that. This one, uh, I like. I just like the photograph. He came to Fort Knox in 1943. It was um, supposedly a secret wartime mission. He went to different war plants, uh, different uh, forts, and, and visit with troops. Uh, so he came to Fort Knox and took a tour. Uh, the soldiers there gave him a tank, uh, which, which he's admiring there. And that's the the governor that followed Chandler sitting next to him, very young governor, but uh, I just like that, that photograph, which I think is pretty good. Um, neither Truman, neither President Truman nor President Eisenhower came to Northern Kentucky. They did come through. Of course, President Truman came through on his uh, whistle stop tour, but the, pres the next president to visit Northern Kentucky was John F. Kennedy. Uh, President Kennedy had visited Northern Kentucky um, in 1960 on, the, on his, in his campaign. Uh, he came in 1960 and, and uh, he narrowly lost Kentucky in 1960. 1962, he came back to the campaign for a Democrat Senate candidate and uh, built some bridges as he, had, as he expected to come and visit and uh, to run again in 1964. So we stopped at CVG and made, uh, made a speech. Uh, the, and he became the first president to visit CVG uh, in 1962. Uh, the press reports were that he had, uh, he was um, a little bit of a disappointing crowd, wasn't very enthusiastic. Of course, this was a very conservative area, even though it's heavily Catholic. And he had been warned by uh, his political advisors, which I, and I saw a memo in the, in the Kennedy Presidential Library that the area was very conservative and the clergy held a big impact on voters. But uh, he spoke here for seven minutes, then went, uh, went to Cincinnati where he had a much bigger rally, much more supportive crowd. Unfortunately, he, uh, the Senate candidate in, Ohio, in Kentucky that he uh, campaigned for, unfortunately for Kennedy, uh, lost that campaign. He had planned to come back in December of 1963 because uh, he had read the series in the New York Times on poverty in Eastern Kentucky. And he had planned a trip, uh, call, he had already called the governor and set it up. Of course, uh, November 22nd, he was assassinated. He was never able to make that trip. But his successor, President Lyndon Johnson did. He came to Eastern Kentucky in 1964, uh, made his famous visit and most of his anti-poverty programs came as a result of what he saw there. He spoke with a, with a gentleman on his, um, on his cabin, at his cabin there. Mrs. Johnson was not scheduled to come with him. He insisted she come so she could see the poverty herself. So she came with him. Um, this photograph is at the same time, and I've included it because, believe it or not, this was 
months after President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And you can see how close they allowed people to get to the president. Um, it's funny because, of course, Mrs. Uh, Johnson is trying to get something out of her purse. And uh, Senator Cooper in front looks like he's about to get smashed. But, but uh, President Johnson was really hands-on and he, uh, he loved mi mixing with the crowds. Um, but his more significant visit uh, to Northern Kentucky was in 1968. Uh, Thomas More College was uh, dedicating a new campus. Of course, Villa Madonna had what college had been located in Covington, but the new college was located in Crestview Hills. This is a rechristening. President Johnson was invited to come. Um, they didn't know until the very last minute whether he's going to come. In fact, two programs were printed. One was printed with the president and they took a program out of town to print with the president. They were trying to keep his visit a secret. Um, you can see him visiting with, with some of the nuns there. You may recognize some of those faces. Uh, pensive photograph. And uh, he met with college officials after his visit, which I think is kind of cool on Air Force One. Uh, president Richard Nixon uh, never made a public appearance in Northern Kentucky, but he did come to the airport several times. And this was uh, before the All-Star Game in, um, let's see, the year was uh, 1970. 1970 All-Star Game was in Cincinnati and President Nixon came to the airport and, and visited there. Uh, President Clinton made the next pub public appearance in Kentucky that was uh, he came to Carrollton, uh, 1998, during his campaign. One of his initiatives was to um, control, get control of tobacco. So he came to Carrollton because that was the center of tobacco production in Kentucky. He wanted to talk to the farmers. Uh, you see Wendell Ford there is on the left and Governor Paul Patton on the right. Um, while Clinton was popular here, most he heavily, most people heavily opposed his attempts to regulate tobacco. Um, so he came to explain his, his purposes. He, um, and he was successful because uh, to, uh, regulation was approved the far, and the farmers did receive uh, payment for their, for their um, yield, for their uh, tobacco, tobacco fields. And finally, uh, President, um, or a couple more, couple more visits, I know we're about to run out of time, but President George Bush visited Kentucky more than any other president, and he spoke at Northern Kentucky University in 2006. Uh, he was obviously quite popular here. He spoke at NKU and then went to the Hilton in Florence, where he had a fundraiser for, at the time, Congressman, uh, uh, for the, for the um, for local congressman. Um, and... Um, he he, uh, he spoke at Regents Hall, which is a very small, very small um, venue. Uh, before, of course, before the new before the new arena was built, but he was supposed to speak on uh, business initiatives because NKU was was very uh, well known for that, and he was congratulating the college on its success in creating entrepreneurs. Instead, he kind of went he went off off uh, track. And spoke more about uh, the war in Iraq, which at that time was uh, was becoming a serious problem for the president. Um, and then he, as I say, he, he left there and went to speak on behalf of Congressman Jeff Davis and raised a lot of money um, for there. Um, and I also want to mention, of course, the most recent visit, uh, President uh, Biden came uh, to Northern Kentucky in January and spoke at the Brent Spence Bridge. Um, the this is, is, I think it's going to be a more significant visit as time goes on because um, along with him was, was, of course, was Senator Mitch McConnell. Uh, he was touting this as an example of his bipartisan work. And I'm sure that during the presidential campaign to come, he is going to make that one of the issues that he was successful in uh, bringing uh, bipartisanship back to Washington. And he's going to use this visit and his visit with Senator McConnell uh, and his appearance with Senator McConnell there as an example of how, how he can work together. So I think we'll be seeing more of this in the presidential campaign to come.
Uh, it's a beautiful day. Covington couldn't have shown off better. Uh, I don't know how they managed such a beautiful day in January, but they did. Uh, of course, um, uh, the mayor uh, mayor uh, was able to get a uh, private visit with the president. And uh, so it's a good day for COVID and I think a good day for Northern Kentucky. One final visit thing I like to always like to show, um, 19, in 1983, Governor John Y. Brown was governor of Kentucky. Of course, he and Phyllis George always had big um, parties, derby parties. And this one in 1983 was especially spectacular because as you can see there, who his guests were, um, Donald Trump, who's, who's speaking there, um, and, his, and his first wife, uh, Ivana, uh, you see uh, Mrs. Carter, who is sitting in front of Donald Trump there. She and, and the former President Carter were there. Uh, as you may recognize on the left, who is there? Uh, Hillary Clinton. Hillary and, and uh, future President Bill Clinton were there. And uh, George and Barbara Bush were there. So he had five men there who were presidents or future presidents. That one, one party. So I was enjoy, enjoy that. Enjoy showing that picture. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Wayne. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing our screen and turn it over to Heather for a second and see, I'm sure we've got some questions and comments for Wayne. Um, we don't have any questions or comments yet. So if anybody has some, go ahead and put those in the chat. But we did have a trivia winner. Um, so I don't know if we want to talk about that a little bit. Just to remind everyone, the question was that there is one spot in Kentucky that has been visited more often by presidents than any other. And where was that? Um, the answer was CVG Airport, and that was answered by Joe Schmidt. So congratulations, Joe. You'll be getting your prize in the mail. Way to go, Joe. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will. There, I do have a book. So I will show if if you're interested in more about presidential visits. Um, there's, I have a book here that talks about all, all of them. And uh, so it's it's at the library or you, or you can buy it. It's on uh, Amazon, Amazon or, uh, or you can check it out from the library, they have copies. Very nice. Well, thank you so much. Um, Heather, do you have any questions for Wayne? I do not. Um, well, how did you get, I, I'm interested how you got started in doing this research and, and how did you start this book? Well, it's just, uh, you know, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I uh, read about a, a visit in the newspaper and it just, it just caught my attention and I thought, well, that's, that must have happened many, many times. Mm -hmm. And uh, of all the great presidents we've had, I'm sure that uh, some of them have been to Kentucky and probably done uh, been some interesting places and so I just started to do started look, looking at the uh, you know going back through some old newspapers and and finding those visits and um, the more I found the more I, uh, I learned and I kept digging until I came up with the list. And what was one of your most interesting finds that you think you found when well, you were researching? I think the, the most interesting thing is how they've changed through the years you know um, when the first president came, there was, there was no press at all. You know, nobody's with, there's no security. Mm -hmm. He was traveling from home to home, uh, spending the night. So it's so different from today when the president flies in. And there's so much, so much advanced work and so much security done. And of course, uh, the, the difference too back then was that uh, people could get close to the president. People would walk up to him and talk to him and communicate with him. Where now that's not not really possible. And you saw some of the photographs of the, just the immense crowds that were there mm -hmm. uh, at, before. You know, before TV, I think the president was was such a celebrity and um, so unusual that people wanted to get close to, to him and see him. Mm -hmm. Um, we did just have a question come in, and they were asking if you knew whether um, when security started for traveling presidents. Um, you know, I, I don't, um, um, the, um, President Theodore Roosevelt is the, had, had like an aide, had aides go with him. They weren't really security, but they would, they would do somewhat protect him because 
he had had a couple of incidents where there were attempts on his life. And so um, I believe he probably was the first president to actually have someone who, who focused on that. But they weren't real. It, was, it wasn't until later, um, I think maybe in, um, until uh, probably the, maybe the 20s, maybe Harding was the first one to actually have dedicated security staff. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah, and, uh, that's, a, that's a future, that's a future book. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. And please, if anyone has any questions or comments, please leave them in the Q&A or in the um, chat. We do have a couple comments. Um, this one, I guess you know this person, is from Judith Marlowe. They said, it's great to see you again. They didn't realize you were living in the air again, and your research is so fascinating in its detail. And what an especially interesting presentation. Um, we do have lots of um, comments coming in saying how great the presentation was. And we did just get another question. They asked if, Eleanor Roosevelt spent some time in Eastern Kentucky. She absolutely did. And that's, you know, that, of course, I didn't focus on her a lot because she was a president. But um, she, of course, she came more than probably any first lady. And she was really the first first lady to travel on her own without the, without the president. She came to Eastern Kentucky a bunch. In fact, there, I've, I've read a couple of reports where she, uh, she drove her own car into Eastern Kentucky. And uh, the roads weren't that great. And there, there was one story where she, uh, her car, like, she had car trouble and had to get help getting out and everything. But um, she came a number of times to Eastern Kentucky, a lot of times to see uh, work that the WPA was doing. Um, I have a great picture of her with uh, a, the Pack Horse Librarian. Some of you may be familiar with that. That's, that's a whole other story. Sometimes I'd love to, we'd love to uh, do a, do a, talk on the, on the pack horse libraries, but, um, and she came to dedicate, there were several schools she came to dedicate, but, and she just came to, uh, just to visit and to make, really to rest several times to Eastern Kentucky. So, so she absolutely did. And, and um, it's a great question. And, and I, I'd love to do more research on that and to get more details on all the times she came and what she did. That is all the questions that we have right now. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. So that kind of works out right there. But I want to, th again, thank you so much, Wayne. Yeah. It was very fascinating. And I encourage everyone to check out his book, um, Presidential Visits to Kentucky, 1819-2017. So thanks again. Yeah. Um,